All right, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar um, on the relationship between ocean carriers and freight forwarders. It's very exciting to have uh, Brian Nemeth with me. He's the managing director at Alex Partners and um, has more than 20 years of industry experience in the global shipping and freight forwarding and third party logistics industry. Um, Brian also has quite some international transportation expertise um, in addition to uh, strategic supply chain logistics experience in, in various industry sectors, being with Alex Partners now for um, over a decade. Um, his experience comes from both sides, the shipping or shipping shipper relationship, um, as well as the uh, asset heavy and asset light companies in this tree. And uh, so this gives them quite a unique insight into what we're going to discuss today. Lastly, Brian, um, he holds um, uh, various uh, positions at, in the United States. He was in Hong Kong or Vietnam with, uh, with Maersk, actually, and has an MBA from New York University. So thank you, Brian, for coming to our fun webinar here today, learning about the relationship of carriers and freight forwarders. Quick uh, intro about myself. I'm Philip Blumenthal. I'm heading the digital transformation at EQ Worldwide. After spending eight years with uh, Schenker, I built the Freighters Marketplace and the Freighters Baltic Index, where you can track container freight rates on a daily basis. So that's it in terms of intros. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, we um, um, are very excited to learn more on the various strategies carriers have and what that means for freight for waters. So a little bit for um, housekeeping. Uh, Brian is giving us a quick overview um, over his studies on um, the impact uh, on freight for waters on, from the carrier strategies. Um, and then afterwards, this will take about five to ten minutes, this will, will go back, have an interactive session between Brian and me. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please enter them in the Q&A section. Um, we will see the questions, and as we come along and see fit, we will include the questions um, in our conversations. Also, you will see some polls coming up. Please don't click them away. Please answer the polls, um, uh, as this will give us some good feedback on how interesting and what kind of feedback you have on this session. So, without further ado, um, Brian, thank you very much for um, being here, and uh, please show us uh, a little bit inside in your studies on the impact of freight for waters from the carrier's profits. Great, yes, thank you for that introduction, Philip. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm gonna do a very brief overview of our uh, annual container paper. Alex Partners has been doing this container paper for almost a decade now. Um, and, and so I'll give a quick overview and all with the perspective of what does it mean for, uh, for a freight forwarder before Philip and I go through that conversation. So an executive summary of, of the study this year, um, the first two elements are, are probably not going to come as a large surprise, 2021. And just so everyone's aware, we do um, we did trailing 12 months, so it's actually quarter three of 21 when we actually did the study. So the numbers are probably, well, not probably, they are better than what you're going to see in the uh, presentation here today. But what everyone's seen and what everyone's aware of, even people not in the industry, as it makes the headlines of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal these days, is the carriers themselves had phenomenal financial year. And, you know, I'm going to quickly show you revenue and profits, but they've been, you know, they've cleaned up their, their balance sheet, they've reduced debt levels. Um, and, you know, they've become much more healthy if you look at the, at the grouping we look at as a whole. The other interesting fact is the carriers now have a windfall, windfall of profits and they need to decide what to do with those profits. And some of them have already made decisions and, and, and some of them have made other decisions. And then there's a lot of dry powder basically being held. And I think that's going to be a big part of the conversation today. Then these other three areas. These came up a lot that aren't directly related to the container shipping space, but elements that are kind of driving behaviors and forces in areas where, you know, as a freight forwarder, you have the ability to really differentiate yourselves, I think, out there. 
And so one is the disruption cycles. So there's always been boom bust cycles and disruption within supply chain. Anyone who's been in the industry for a while knows there's always little hiccups along the way. But what we're seeing is, a, a, you know, that these disruptions, these cycles are accelerating at a rapid pace. And so, right, we had COVID obviously was the major underlying disruption, but then you had things like the ever given getting grounded in the Suez. And then you had port shutdowns in, uh, in, in Shanghai, actually the most recent. And then you have the labor union negotiation that's gonna be occurring in the summer or is occurring right now. So these little disruptions, what we're finding and when we interview carrier shippers forwarders are happening at a lot more rapid pace than they've historically occurred. And from a freight forwarding perspective, right? Freight forwarders have historically been much more agile and had a much stronger ability to adapt than the asset owning carriers. So I think this disruption environment lends itself well to, uh, to the freight forwarders. The other area that's been a highlight is service levels. And, you know, as a forwarder, you're in the middle, right? You're, you're taking stuff from the carriers and you're hearing it from your shippers. We all know how challenging the current environment is. Um, service level has deteriorated at, you know, such a rapid rate and it's the poorest we've seen it in a while. Uh, and again, this creates unique opportunities, freight forwarders, have the ability to, you know, open the aperture and, and pull different levers than carriers. And this is a, re a strong way to differentiate yourselves. And when I've noticed when I've been working with shippers over the last year and a half is freight forwarders have really differentiated themselves with clients in these really tough times. The last piece that's a little bit more strategic is kind of the ESG environments, the uh, ESG initiatives in general. There's definitely consensus in the container shipping environment that something needs to be done and things are being pushed that way, but there isn't consensus on how to do it. And again, I think this lends itself to a forwarder model being able to, to help their shippers navigate this because different shippers are going to have very different demands and having access to a portfolio of carriers that might meet these demands is going to be a, you know, a unique offering and a way to differentiate yourselves from the carriers themselves. Great, thank you, thank you, uh, and yeah, let, let's go a little bit into um, the, uh, the 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 profits, uh, right, of the carriers and and how they spend their profits. Yep, exactly. So I think what you look you see here over the last decade, you see this huge increase in revenue. Um, you know, the one eighty two to two sixty five, and what's interesting about it in our subset is all that money went to the bottom line, and you could see that here a sixteen time increase from pre-pandemic levels. So just want to highlight that the revenues come in, the costs haven't gone up, you know, they've gone up, but they haven't gone up nearly as, as quickly as the rates themselves, which, you know, as uh, constituents and participants in this, um, in this space, we all know how much the rates have increased since kind of the summer of, uh, of 2020 and just the rapid rise that's occurred since. And again, you know, for people who aren't as familiar, right, the Shanghai uh, freight index, there's three lines here. There's the global index, the Asia Europe and the Asia to the US, the most popular trades. So this is a global phenomenon, right? This is uh, every, everywhere you go, the rates have increased, the volatility has increased, which again, lends itself um, to, to freight forwarders, you know, again, differentiating themselves. So what did all these profits mean? This pie chart here basically is from 2020 to the end of Q3 2021. And it shows how the cash outflow has occurred over that time period and what the current situation is. And the most interesting thing is the cash reserves, right? There's still 54% of those billions of dollars are still fundamentally sitting in a bank account, right? Uh, if you look at the other areas and, and that's what we're going to, we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about that more uh, during the conversation today, but the other ways they're spending that money is 13% was debt pay down. That was a big deal. The balance sheets of these carriers were, you know, a lot of them were struggling and, you know, everyone remembers what happened to Hanjin. Healthy balance sheets mean more providers, means more options for the freight forwarders. The other area was dividends, 6%. So rewarding shareholders that had invested into the business. 
Then there's elements of acquisition and, and CapEx. Acquisition, again, there's been a ton of M&A, but not everything is obviously purchased in cash, right? There's stock trades and, and things get financed. And so you could actually see on the bottom, I mean, there's nine and a half billion dollars of value deals that have been announced that will be closed over the next 18 months. That doesn't mean all that cash in the reserve will draw down. Like I said, there's different ways to finance and create uh, acquisitions. But again, it's important to highlight. And then CapEx is the next piece is, and you can see it was 18% there. And really the CapEx is on equipment, but by far the biggest piece is the order book. And again, this is really important from a freight forwarder perspective and people who've been in the industry a long time. If you look pre financial crisis there, you see the big peak of, of order book capacity coming online. And then you see the steady drop for almost a decade. And now you're seeing almost record levels again. And so there's going to be a lot of supply, a lot of vessels coming online. And then in addition to that, there's the effective capacity, right? The, the vessels that are waiting at outer Anchorage in LA and Long Beach right now are unable to be utilized. And so when the bottleneck goes away, you have that capacity plus all this new order book capacity coming online at the same time. And what this leads to when you look historically is when there's a lot of capacity, the carriers tend to reach out to the forwarding marketplace again, right? Because they need to fill, fill those ships and they don't have the sales force to be able to reach every single importer and every single shipper. And the tendency is to go back to the forwarding community when you look at historical cycles and how they've gone. The other element to call out, uh, I mentioned in the executive summary, schedule reliability. The C intelligence guys do a great job with this. Um, here's their, their charts, the global schedule reliability from basically the summer of, of when COVID began has just deteriorated. And you can see that one little bullet for 31%. That's January of 2022, the lowest it's been. So reliability is really low. And then the delays are increasing. On the right, you can see the average delays on the global side. And you can see 7.4 days, which is kind of basically equally as high as it was in December of 2021, but basically record high. And so again, why is schedule reliability important? You guys talking, you know, you as forwarders talking to your shippers want to make sure you can offer a product that your shipper can count on. Um, and what you're, what's happening here is you're stuck in the middle, right? The carriers aren't able to deliver. The shippers are getting frustrated. But a way that shippers can, can differentiate themselves is offering other options, other routings, other carriers, different service levels using air freight instead of ocean and consolidation and transload. And so, again, this... This reliability issue opens opportunities for, for forwarders. So switching back to how the carriers are going to spend some of this money, like I said, 54% of all these profits are still sitting in a bank account. We discussed new vessel acquisitions and we discussed um, service level a little bit. There's a few other buckets here and, and you'll notice on the bottom the potential impacts for freight forwarders of each of these buckets on, on the perspective. And I think Philip and I will talk about these more. Um, again, ESG is going to be a big thing in the future, right? It's already becoming a big deal. There's shippers who are signing up to reduce their carbon footprint and using, you know, the underlying asset carrier is going to be the driver of this, but the forwarders having access to those carriers and being able to provide it to the shippers will be uh, critical. Upstream and downstream expansion or M&A, this is probably the one that's most top of mind for all the forwarders. There's carriers that are um, doing a lot of M&A and there's carriers that are not. And so you see different buckets and, and this is something we'll dig deeper into. Supply chain digitalization. I think freight forwarders have always been ahead of the, the carriers themselves, but carriers becoming more efficient um, will benefit the forwarders also. Dividends and buybacks, again, if, they're, if, if that money can't be spent elsewhere, you'll see it back in shareholders' pockets. The reduction of debt levels, again, cleaner, nicer balance sheets, better for the industry, better for options, better for the freight forwarding marketplace. And the last piece is the increase in cash reserves, saving the money for a rainy day, for lack of a better way to describe it. I think that's the one wild card is how are they going to spend the money in the, uh, in the bank account? So that could go, you know, in favor of, of a forwarder environment or 
uh, or it could be a disadvantage. And so that's something where we, we wait and see how that, how that continues to play out. Great. Let me uh, um, interrupt uh, here for a second. We have a poll uh, that um, I like to uh, take. Uh, what do you see is the uh, biggest challenge uh, to, uh, to you um, for your forwarding business? So um, if you want to click on uh, the answers, I got to leave it open. Um, we get some, also some interesting questions coming in, uh, which we're going to answer after Brian has um, uh, finished his um, uh, presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to learn more about it. Thank you everyone for um, answering these polls. Great. Okay, so Brian, do you want to um, continue on your side while we leave the yep. poll open for another minute? Yes. No, that sounds perfect. So another area that you know that, that's brought the profile of this to a whole new level is our CEO runs a, a CEO survey. Three thousand CEOs around the world across all industries, so not just transportation and logistics and freight forwarders across all industries. And what I thought was unique, normally, you know. I wanted to share it this year because 72% uh, percent of, um, well, actually, sorry, 69% of CEOs have supply chain as their top concern. The next co concern is the workforce. And then the concern after that is digital. And the reason why I thought this was interesting is all three of these directly relate to the freight forwarding, you know, freight forwarding segment, right? 60, if, if CEOs are worried about supply chain, there's an education level. And I think a lot of freight forwarders and transportation professionals have found themselves educating executives. Um, and so I think that, you know, this is going to be a critical topic. Workforce impacts the forwarders themselves, right? One way to differentiate. And I think one of the most important things for freight forwarders is the war for talent right now. It's hard to get good people. Um, you know, it's an inflationary labor market. Talent is one of the ways that a non-asset providing freight forwarder really can differentiate itself. And then digitalization, that's again, another very common theme across industries and for freight forwarding, you know, it's a, it's a threat, right? The, the old guard of freight forwarders need to improve their technology. And then you have these whole digital forwarders and startups that are coming into the market to disrupt. And, and so this digitalization, and, and it works on two scales. One is the visibility, right? The customer facing side of it. And the other is your back office, right? How are you gonna make it more efficient and, and more cost effective to make a, be able to offer a more cost competitive uh, marketplace? And so the last slide here, um, and the last slide for today is, what does this all mean for, for the different players within the container shipping value chain. And, you know, from an ocean carrier perspective, we're going to talk about the different strategies. But the big takeaway right now is there's still a lot of cash in the bank and how they use that cash is going to is going to kind of be the, the hand that you're dealt as a freight forwarder. Forwarders and, and 3PLs, I think you're still in a very unique position where, you know, you can differentiate yourselves. And, and again, I think the, the two elements I spoke about are talent and technology, um, you know, relationships with shippers and, and the ability to make your back office more efficient and to create more visibility in the supply chain are really going to be critical. And then the shippers and the importers are extremely frustrated. And we all know that we're hearing it. They're frustrated that they're paying a lot more. They're getting more service. Um, they're getting, you know, to be honest, the logistics and the supply chain people are getting asked a lot of tough questions by their C-suite. There's been a lot of pressure and frustration on them, and they're looking for relief. And lastly, investment, right? We talked about the, you know, the, on, the, the order book being very large. You might get new investors in the space for containing shipper companies, for freight forwarders. We're already seeing it, right? If private equity, venture capital coming in drives more cash into the space and, and more investment. So, so Philip, I'll stop there. I think this is uh, the overview of a lot of the findings we had in our container paper and how they kind of relate to the, to the freight forwarding world. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, very insightful. Let's dive a little bit deeper in it. Um, there were some questions. First of all, yes, we're going to um, uh, post the recording later for those who have missed the beginning.
So thank you for, for that question. Um, coming back to the poll we just had, uh, about half of you answered that cost of containers and uh, unpredictability unpredict is the biggest challenge right now um, and for your customers. But about a third of you answered that shipping companies are reaching shippers or or, or, or BCOs directly, container companies reaching to, to shippers directly. That's the biggest challenge for you right now. So um, Brian, let's dive a little bit deeper into that topic. Um, we talked about um, the, the, the container lines as such. You showed the profit from the container lines as such, but is it truly that every container, um, uh, every liner, every steamship line um, has the same strategy or are there different strategies among the different carriers? Can you bucket them? Can you differentiate them? Yeah, no, it's it's a good question, Philip. And, and again, from a forwarder's perspective, it's a very important question, right? You have a subset of carriers who are doing vertical integration, right? They want to be a one-stop shop. They're investing in last mile companies and warehousing companies, and they're doing it in certain geographies or they're doing it on a global level. And what they want to be able to offer is kind of the one-stop shop to their customers, which has historically been the freight forwarders sweet spot, right? And so you're seeing one bucket that's doing that and then another bucket that are specifically saying they're not interested in doing that, right? There might be some investment maybe in a terminal and, and that's more of control of, of the core business, but you're seeing another subset of those carriers going, we don't want to get into logistics, right? Where our core, our core business is, you know, sweating our assets, you know, running a container, a container shipping company and, and doing that the best we can. And so, you know, to oversimplify it, if you look at those buckets, the, the, the M and a bucket, those guys are, are directly competing with freight forwarders that have historically been their client base. And then the other carriers are, are basically putting their flag in the sand and saying, Hey, we're going to keep using, you know, the forwarder, uh, the forwarder marketplace and, and view them as, as, as partners. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to gain a little bit, uh, understanding of, uh, who is, uh, with us here today, I'll start another poll asking who actually is afraid for water, um, so that we know the audience a little better, but while you answer this question, um, everyone, um, uh, I want to ask Brian the next question. So, so Brian, uh, you said, okay, there are two buckets of carriers, those that uh, directly compete with freight for waters and those basically that stay in their lane or or integrate into different um, uh, different areas. So so um, let's think from a freight for water perspective, uh, right? So I see about uh, over two thirds here participating today are freight for waters. Um, what can I do as a freight for water when I'm competing now with a carrier? And 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 I I'm constant, constantly confronted with like technology, service offering, visibility, backend technology. What 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 is it from your angle that you can do? Yeah, I think there's. I'm going to break it into two buckets. One is very simple. Wait and see how the integrators are doing. I think, you know, as freight forwarders, I see 66% of the audience, right? It looks like are freight forwarders. We all know the, the culture of, of running a 3PL freight forwarding or a logistics company is very different than kind of a, historically a container shipping company, right? And if, you know, if you think about it, a container shipping company, at its core business is, is about sweating the assets and getting good return on capital. And it's a different business model than a freight forwarder, which is asset light. And then if you go even further from the asset light kind of hustler mentality of buying low, selling high and, and finding the right shippers, and you go beyond that and you do services like purchase order management or contract logistics and warehousing, then you start to get into very different cultures. And so one thing to watch is how are these carriers going to integrate these logistics companies? Because that's a very hard task. It's not impossible, but it's a hard task. So if they're successful, they become, you know, an extreme threat. If they struggle a little bit, it actually becomes a potential opportunity. Um, and so watching how successful they are in this integration journey is one element. Now, the proactive element, the other side of that is, I think there's two, if I'm a freight forwarder, I'm focused on two things, ta talent and technology. Um, again, a lot of our business is, is still relationship based, right? That shipper wants to be able to say, I trust you, Philip. 
I know Philip's going to go through a brick wall for me and he's going to find that ship for me, that sailing for me. He's going to really help me move my box. So I think getting the right people is going to be a critical element for a, uh, for a freight forwarder. And then the second piece is the technology. So the other way to stay ahead of the, of, of the carrier is just to be technolo technologically more advanced. And, and again, I think we touched on it a little bit already is there is the client facing piece, the visibility of aggregating all this data across the supply chain and condensing it and in, in providing it back to the shipper in a succinct way where they can use it to make important business decisions, where they can use it to communicate to their management team what's happening, where is the box, when is it actually going to arrive. And then the other side of that coin is is optimizing the back office, right? And so investing in, you know, you see a lot of TMS in, uh, investment over the last few years by, you know, different freight forwarders. And you see the new freight forwarders that are already digitally native with the venture capital investment, but finding ways to make the back office more efficient gives you potentially a cost advantage and, uh, you know, a better customer experience on the front end on that side. And so, when I say technology, it could be simple as like RPA services, right? Like getting quotes or sailing schedules, having an RPA solution, a robotic, you know, kind of bot basically responding versus a human being constantly responding to those things, you know, that frees up the human being to do more value added activities. And you also get quicker responses. So you, it's like, and, and it's cheaper, right? So you improve the service level, you free up the human capital to do more challenging elements and you get a cost reduction, right? And so things like that, tactics like that are gonna be critical for uh, for freight forwarders to basically continue to try to stay ahead of the carrier space. Yeah, okay. Yeah, what we what we see on our side um, also is that uh, freight forwarders freight forwarder are coming to us and, and asking us basically how to get technologically um, ahead of the game. And um, and often it's, it's, it's rather low hanging fruit Right, it's it's not basically implementing these um, uh, uh, these these, these uh, advanced technologies that you still need to try out. It's often basically like very simple uh, an, an, an ERP system um, that might be available in the market, but also just using the available um, uh, just the available tools that are in the market um, from from uh, uh, companies, for example, like uh, like us, but but also um, something that's available off the shelf, right? So that's what we see on our side. I want to open up the uh, Q&A a little bit. Please ask your questions or also in the Q&A, just type in what you think that makes you successful um, in uh, your new competition with uh, ocean carriers. So um, having an, uh, another poll out here is um, we're talking a little bit about the different technologies that is available. What do you think that will gain advantage in the market? Is it digital quoting, booking, and visibility of cargo to your customers? Are these freight for water payment solutions? We've talked a little bit about um, cash, but I want to di dive a little deeper into this, Brian, on the on the cash side, uh, because volatile freight rates have a pretty, pretty large impact on cash flow. Um, is it offering additional um, services such as insurance um, or tracking solutions, for example, through a visibility provider, GPS tracking solution, and so on. We want to we want to know this. Please please answer this poll. Uh, while we do this, Brian, maybe we can dive into um, a more on the on the cash side. Um, uh, the cash flow impact for freight for waters. Um, how do freight for waters tackle this right now? And, 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 and we all know freight, freight rates are slightly coming down. Is there relief inside for freight for waters on this? No, I think uh, as a freight forwarder, you're revisiting all of those credit arrangements and <laughs> terms and, and aggressively managing your, your receivables, right? To ensure that you're not stuck in a, in a working capital crunch. And I think what you've also seen now though is is a lot of third party. This is a, there's a whole, you know, startups uh, subset of businesses that are finding ways to facilitate payment and, and, and do elements of the, of the payments in different manner. Right. So ocean freight as a forwarder, you might be stuck with, but maybe if you're doing customs duties or a drage on the back end or some other elements, you might be able to work with third parties. And, and if cash flow is the challenge, you obviously pay a little bit of a price. 
but you could use that technology as a lever to to help with your cash flow if that becomes an issue. Yeah. But I think what it's going to lead to in the long run is when you when you start to start new arrangements with with customers, you know, looking very hard at how many days credit you're going to give a customer is going to become a very critical component, right? Because like you just said, you can't be exposed to you know, 10 times what you thought you were going to be or whatever, four times or whatever the metric number is. And, and then you have to float that for 30 days. Yeah. 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 So, so we get quite some questions in here about the uh, freight rates and the uh, freight rate uh, development. Uh, one t uh, topic I want to discuss with you is um, when you think of um, uh, now FAK rates falling below long-term contracts, Right, uh, we see basically a sliding sliding of rates and margins. Will the freight for water regain, so to say, the upper hand over those uh, carriers that now start integrating deeper into the freight for water space? Is there a, what, what do you see on the strategies from the carriers? Um, how how do they defend this, and what how will freight uh, uh, ocean carriers that now go directly to shippers react? Um, it, it, when the freight rates uh, uh, slide down, when there will be more capacity in the market, you showed it in one slide, um, and freight forwarders now have the ability, again, to choose from different carriers. What, what, what will ocean carriers do? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, I go back, I've been in this space for now 20 years, right? And so it's cyclical in nature. And right now, I think the carriers have the leverage, the actual asset owning container shipping lines have the advantage because if I, let's say I have an allocation of 10 containers a week, right? That was the contract I negotiated and maybe it is higher than the spot at the moment. But if I don't deliver my 10, then in the current environment, the carrier will then take my allocation away, right? Maybe now all of a sudden, if I only delivered eight in one week, because I put two on the spot market because it was cheaper. Now I get punished for lack of a better word to describe it. And I'm only allowed eight going forward and I can't get back to the 10. And then the spot rate shoots up, right? Shanghai right now is on lockdown. There's a hundred vessel, hundred plus vessels waiting to uh, pick up cargo there. I would imagine that there's going to be a potential uh, spot rate tick up again. Right. And so I think in the current environment, they still have the leverage to do it. Right. And, and, and that was what they would use now is on the allocation. But as a freight forwarder, there's a lot of customers that aren't able to get contracts. And so right now you have to be in this hustle mode and, and, and the volatility should be the friend of the forwarder. I mean, not, you know, the shippers aren't as informed on what's going on in the market as, as the freight forwarder is. Right. And so volatility should I mean, to be straightforward, should lead to more profits for the forwarder. Right. You, there's a little bit of a delay you get, you know, the rates going up before, the shipper knows and you know the rates going down before the shipper does and you could lock them in but when you talked about the future i think when the capacity goes back up philip this is the nature of the cycle right then you'll go back to the way it was historically been done pre-covid and i think the carriers will become a lot more dependent again on the forwarders like they'll want to fill the capacity they'll want to fill the vessels and like i said they typically don't have the sales force the one risk there is the digitalization, right? To be able to make a self-serve option um, for customers to just go online and book that container. If that is very well adopted, then it, it puts a little bit more pressure on the forwarders. But once there's over capacity instead of under, you know, basically too much demand that there is now, then I think the dependency on the forwarders tends to increase. Yeah, yeah. There's some good questions coming in. Um, uh, one, uh, Paul, Paul asked, um, is uh, in the meantime, where um, the freight for waters don't have that negotiation power than they had before? Um, I think, uh, 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 Rodrigo, you were uh, referencing to this as well. Um, when, when, when basically yeah, they, they're, 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 the, the carriers have uh, the, the upper hand in negotiation, um, it doesn't make sense um, to join associations um, uh, for fall waters and, and negotiate together. Um, I think uh, maybe answering this, um, uh, 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 yeah, answering this on my side, 
obviously uh, like a larger negotiation power. We've seen this uh, comparing large freight forwarders with mid-sized forwarders um, always have uh, the higher uh, gross, gross profit margin. Um, so it obviously helps to pool um, <clears throat> freight together and negotiate with freight forwarders. I don't know, Brian, what your perspective is on basically pooling, pooling freight together in an association. I think in, in the current environment, I actually would be a little potentially a little concerned, right? Because I don't know how much the carriers want to give, um, right? If, if I'm an ocean carrier right now, I want dependable, reliable cargo on specific lanes and specific lanes that I want to invest in now in exchange for long-term volume that you're going to give me on those lanes, right? I, hopefully you're, if, again, I'm, this is my ocean carrier lens, not the freight forwarder lens, but they're looking for you know, freight in the long term, strategic freight that they want on on certain lanes. And, and I get concerned when I even when I see big BCOs, if they're saying, hey, I have 100 boxes last year and I want 110, the carriers are saying, no, you still get the 100. So I would get worried if freight forwarders came together and said, hey, we want 1,000, they would be like, no, right? We, we don't want to give that much capacity to anybody. We're not giving it to our BCO, let alone, you know, doubling capacity on the other side. So I think it could be challenging now. I think where it would make sense is in the down market potentially to go back <laughs> yeah, as yeah, an yeah. association and say, Hey, we want to negotiate as 10 of us on whatever yeah. Southeast Asia to Europe. Okay. I want to come more a little bit to uh, what faithful waters can do on the digital side. Um, so because there's a lot of uh, market development and rates, but there's more than freight for waters can do um, outside uh, just basically reacting to freight rates, right? So um, coming back to the poll um, that uh, we just uh, uh, we just closed, 65%, so about th two thirds of, of uh, the respondents here said digital quoting, booking and visibility of cargo is the advantage you can take over um, freight for water, uh, over carriers. Uh, and about uh, a quarter of you said tracking solutions. So it's back to what the biggest challenges are, is um, the cost, the visibility, as well as digital solutions um, that, they, that they bring in. But where to start, right? Where do you start with digital quoting and, and visibility of cargo? Where do you start with tracking solutions? Um, um, I don't know, Brian, if you have a perspective on this, um, I have an answer, but maybe Brian, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised that that was the, the biggest ask, right? I mean, if you think about it right now, or historically, it's been really tough to just go and self-serve, say, hey, I need a quote from Shanghai to LA and I need it now. Um, and, and the same thing with this automatic booking. It, it, it's historically been complex. So taking it, the complexity out and democratizing the ability of the shipper to use like a quick tool to get there is is a huge advantage. And then the visibility, you'll be surprised how many clients I've worked with that are literally have containers on Excel sheets still, right? They're not using their 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 freight forwarder or ocean carrier or technology. So I think having a technology that allows a business to, to, to have business insights and be able to make decisions is gonna be a big value add. Right. If I know that my product is going to potentially be two weeks late in time enough where I can still potentially do some of it as air freight, there's a ton of value in knowing that where historically it just shows up and then we find out, you know, two weeks later that it's going to be two weeks late and there's nothing that could be done. So I think those those are the when I look at those three elements, those are big pain points of the customer base I work with when I work on the shipper side. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so from our perspective, what we see is that um, uh, it's definitely not too late for any size of freight for water to go digital, um, and especially if you're small, mid-sized for water, um, you're more nimble. Your more um, uh, your, your ability to implement technology um, is is probably higher simply because you can adjust your workflow and your processes quicker. You probably also don't have to uh, have these complex different scenarios worldwide that you all need to, to cater for. So the answer, I think one participant said, is it too late to go digital? No, it is not. And especially if you're small, mid-sized forwarder, um, it, it is not. The second thing is, is just keep the eye um, 
or the ear on, on what your customers are saying, right? And, and two thirds of you said like, look, I believe our customers are saying they want something, uh, uh, they want to book and quote, quote and book digital online. Is that is that really what you what you like uh, what your customers like or is it more on the visibility side? What often just a few questions to your existing customers will give you guidance of what product that is in the shelf you can you can pick and you can buy. Um, so um, you don't need to look very far. Um, and often um, uh, the first question is with carriers. Brian mentioned it. Not all carriers are directly competing with the shippers, some other carriers staying with the freight forwarders as their, um, uh, as their service partners. Often having a conversation with these carriers will help you say like, hey, what do you have that I can use for my customers? What do you have as a visibility tool? What do you have as an uh, online tools that I can reuse? And that's often even free of charge. So if you start with that, asking your customers, going to your vendor saying, what can you offer? And then what you can't get from your from your vendors, just basically research and buy in the market. Um, that's often the first way to to go digital on on your side. Um, and and uh, yeah, so so that's that's basically to sum it up on uh, on, on 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 the uh, uh, on the digital side. Um, I think there is also a pretty wide uh, window of opportunity. Um, often our customers. Um, asking and getting stressed out of like, we need to have a solution in the next three months because once COVID is over, uh, then basically like there will be a new era starting. I think we've seen the digitalization over the last couple of years. And I wouldn't say it is, uh, you should sit back and wait, but definitely it's not too late um, to um, uh, to start now, right? Um, so then, um, uh, so, so, so uh, uh, that's basically on the on the digital side. We see some more, um, uh, uh, yeah, questions coming in. I think lots of people are interested on the macro side. Um, and uh, let me ask you uh, one one question here um, that um, I see throughout different question, to, uh, different uh, different um, um, uh, uh, Q and A questions. Um, so, inflation is increasing. And also with, uh, you know, uh, the Russian Ukrainian situation, uh, we have a regionalization of supply chains, right? What do I as a forwarder need to prepare for when I see basically these macro trends of regionalization, um, inflation? Um, what are my actionables? What do I do need to do now uh, to prepare, uh, prepare for that? Yeah, it, it... <laughs> It's, it is a tough environment. I think it's, you have to try to be ahead of your customer base and every customer industry space is, is dealing and responding in different manner. So, you know, if you're automotive, you're going to have a very different automotive centric, you're gonna have a very different strategy than if you're retail centric or if you're consumer product centric. Um, but it's really understanding where your customers are going to go. Right? So if somebody was a hundred percent in China, and, you know, they're indicating they're going to be 20% in Mexico and 80% in China in the future. You know, if you want to keep that customer, you better have a really good operation in Mexico or you're just not going to be able to meet your customer's needs. So I think you have your, your options are you yourself as a company look at the macro trends and decide where you want to be or the other option, which I think is personally better is you have a lot of engagement with your customers and say, hey, this has happened. The last few years have been rough. Has it led to a change in your strategy? Because we want to be there with you and we want to help you out. And maybe you already are in Mexico and your value add is I can introduce you to a few different vendors that we know that we've worked with some of, with some of our other customers or, or, or parties that we've met along the way. So you can almost turn this into a, an opportunity. Um, but I think talking to your customers is probably the the simplest and, and probably the best way to, to try to get ahead of the curve. Um, and like I said, there's not a one size fits all, right? Every industry is slightly different in how they're responding to this and in long term what it means. Yeah. 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 So I think there, um, um, another question that's coming in from different angles is like, um, how can I, um, uh, how can I get ahead of the curve? Are there any new services or any trends that I can impact? And I think um, there was a question on 
uh, there the port lockdowns in Shanghai. How is it impacting uh, basically other other countries? How can I get ahead of this? Um, then the other question is basically on on, on are there any new services? Uh, the U.S. port congestions, um, uh, moving basically supply chains. How can I get ahead of this? Um, then basically uh, no, additional merger and acquisitions from carriers. How can I get ahead of this? Um, are there any new services? And so the question, Brian, is is basically, is there anything that is new, any new services that you see coming up that I can uh, 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 can can be par imparts to my to my clients. I think it's 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 hard to say that there's something new per se, but what you're seeing is increased usage of services like the buyers consolidation or PO consolidation, basically consolidation at origin, right? You know, bringing cargo from different vendors for the same customer, and and taking what's critical and making sure those get into a certain container and taking what they also still desperately want, but maybe not as critical and putting them in other containers. So having the ability to offer a service like that, right, is just another way to be flexible and give your customer an alternative, right? If they're using a carrier that only goes from port to port and you're able to provide consolidation, that gives you the ability to differentiate. And on the destination side, it's transloading. And these things have been around forever, whatever, 20, 30. Well, PO consolidation has been around for like 30 years. And, and I don't even know how long transloading has been around. But these are activities that you see a much, you're seeing at a much higher frequency. And, and having the ability, and this is again why freight forwarders have the advantage over the carriers. Asset light, agile, and the ability to adapt. You know, find a partner to offer these services. And then you come to your customer and you give them alternatives to what they have today. Um, but again, when you think about all the disruptions that are occurring, you have to be creative too, right? Are there different routings? Do I do sea air products? Um, you know, all these different ways to look at how the supply chain operates. Being creative is, is a unique opportunity right now. And shippers are much more open to creative ideas than they've historically been, right? You're going to, right now you're seeing a lot of people because of the ILWU negotiation, routing cargo to the East coast, to the Gulf, and you need to be able to have those solutions for your, for your client base to, you know, to give them that opportunity. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, then um, my my last question to you, Brian, uh, and please keep asking questions in the Q and A. Is um, uh, uh, it, it, it's basically like whom can I truly trust, right? So you've discussed basically in the very beginning, there are uh, the carriers had enormous profit. Uh, you discuss basically how they spend it. They mostly keep it as a, as a work chest. We discussed the different freight rates and. Um, how, how the impacts on freight rates. We discussed technology, but like now, now basically I learned all this in this webinar, but I want to discuss it with someone, right? So, so, so whom from the carriers can I trust? Uh, who, who else from a, from, from uh, technology providers, consultants, who can I trust? Who do I go to discuss this? I, I think it, the big thing still is relationships in this business. And, it, you know, Philip, you and I have been around a long time with it. There's still a large element of the people that you've met along the way that you know and you trust that you want to work with because you know they go the extra mile to help you deliver for your customer. Um, and, and I think also working very closely with your customer and your customer base are, are critical. So go to the partners that have been reliable, especially during COVID, right? A lot of leopards show their spots right in the when when it, you're under pressure and times are bad and so what one of the takeaways you should reflect on the last few years and say which partners were there for me right who worked with me who helped me solve a unique problem that was difficult to solve who can i count on and who can i depend on and i, I think there's a big element of of that leveraging those relationships to find the solutions that you want to continue to do in the future and it can be on both sides and it can be collaborative. You could, you could take your customer and then you could pick a, an ocean carrier that you have a good relationship with. And the three of you could sit in a room together and say, how do we solve this, this problem together? Um, so I think 
to me, it's about relationships uh, in, in the current current environment. So, so uh, uh, Bill brought another topic up, like uh, the EFA waters that are new new in the market. I want to address this uh, quickly, saying like, hey, now the carrier is getting to my space, but also EFA waters uh, with all their fancy technology. Um, I think it's a, it's a great uh, it's great what they're offering. Uh, mostly, basically, this level of supply chain management, PO management that customers are doing it or shippers are doing on their own right now and allowing them, giving them tools for free to do this. But often these e waters in the back end are still freight for waters and are still struggling with the same process that everyone else. And some, some e waters have, uh, have, yeah, uh, 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 automated uh, workflows on the back, a uh, back end. But what we see from our side, it's mostly the front end. That has um, that has been um, advanced and, and and that led them to quite some success among their customers. And Nicola, uh, to, to to your topic, where you're basically saying like, look, uh, if my customers are using all these tools, will will I not be obsolete? No, I th I think uh, a lot of shippers are asking freight forwarders for answers around what you just answered in the poll: visibility um, and and ability to uh, directly do the transactional work. Um, on an easy basis, but there's a lot of lag work in the back end, especially when um, uh, in, in, in good old freight for water English ship happens, right? Uh, then often the freight for water is asked to, to handle the situation. And that's basically where you stand out from the crowd, being there as a trusted partner when things don't go right, right? So, so um, that's basically the answer on it's not too late Uh, EFA waters have done a great uh, move in providing um, online solutions for shippers, but you can still catch up to this as, as freight for waters utilizing online technology um, that is there and a little bit, you see it here on my logo, um, we are from Eco360, you can come to our side and also utilize our tools that we have um, out there. Good. So um, with that said, uh, Brian, I leave the uh, last words to you. Um, any further, any closing remarks you have? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's interesting times, right? And and so, again, I, I just want to highlight we, people who've been in this industry for a while know it's cyclical, right? And so what's happening today, two years from now, might be kind of the opposite situation. Um, but I always, I, I go back to, your clients, right? You have a client base, you've established a client base, you're growing your client base and identifying what they really need is, is, is going to be what's most critical to your success, right? Because if you've developed that relationship and evolved for them over time, they're not going to be so quick to switch to somebody else if they're offering the same thing or something similar. So I think it's kind of follow, follow your customer would probably be, be my mantra here. Um, but obviously all the points we spoke about, Philip, you have to keep a careful eye on it. How well will those carriers that are doing the integration strategy actually integrate? You know, having your ear to the ground to know that, oh, they're falling here, right? That's an opportunity. That's when you could sweep in and say, hey, they dropped the ball. We know how to do this. Um, so being very uh, mindful of what's happening in, 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 on that side of the table and at the same time, Focusing on your talent and focusing on your technology, all in the context of, of your customer. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. A few words uh, from my side um, uh, to, to add to this. Um, there is a lot of transactional work you do on a daily basis that is a pretty standard workflow. There is technology out there you can utilize to save time to uh, really focus on the customer, as just Brian said, on the shipper um, uh, in, in, in for times or, 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 or areas where you don't um, have a standard workflow uh, for exceptions, for uh, shipments that get delayed, for shipments that got damaged. So utilize technology. Um, uh, and I think you definitely have a competitive advantage when you implement this technology um, over large, big uh, conglomerate, especially carriers uh, that are not that nimble uh, in adjusting. So um, overall, uh, overall sets, the answer to uh, this, um, are carriers taking over the space? 
I don't think we don't um, have a precise answer to this yet. Um, uh, let's wait and see, especially with the volatile freight rates coming in. Um, there might be an opening back up for freight for waters. Stay in the course, listen to your customers, utilize technology that's available. I do thank everyone here in the room for uh, joining. I'm very excited that um, almost everyone who joined stayed actually to the very end. Um, uh, that's a very good sign. We put good content out there. We have recorded it, so you can rewatch it. And um, please come and visit us uh, also at Eco360 for more content. We post it there. Um, you can also approach Brian and me um, um, uh, separately for any questions you might have. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.